coming up in today's episode. This, this is something I reiterate to all of my players. I keep telling them your career is so short. Please mm. do not look back at your career in a couple of years and regret that you did not give everything. This opportunity that you mm. do have is everything because it's not lasting forever. So for me, I want to also be able to provide knowledge to people generally in the in the tier three, tier two scene that kind of really want to kind of make step forwards. I guess what kind of things did you see in their play that you think that sets you apart as a team? That's the kind of thing that other teams need to strive for. The previous experience in in Counter Strike made them a step ahead of some of the competition. Yeah, there's a lot of people that had experience, but being able to transfer the skills is not something everyone can do and all of a sudden you're a step below um i guess from your perspective how do you get to that point how do you build that synergy you know if you're a team and you you, you want to kind of work towards that how how do you think you can do that i don't think there's any secret sauce or or mm, anything mm. for it i think and what's your personal approach with... what are you going to do that enables you to win the round and that's always well why are we doing anything in a round is well ultimately that's what it should lead to is the the thing that's going to make us win the round that they just walked into a four stack of guys on a site with a setup with all the util there the and, yeah because yeah, it's a strat right but then people yeah. don't think every set play is not fulfilled or is not complete without the understanding of the broader spectrum and the broader principles because mm. when you run a strat and you own you probably sat down with your team by this point and kind of discussed what you would like to achieve in the, in the next season. I'm interested to hear kind of what that discussion was like and, and kind of what conclusions you came to. Mm. For us, it's very black and white. We're going to do the best possible. We know if we look back, it's not because of a lack of trying. Yeah, uh, yeah. I hope you enjoyed that short introduction, just showcasing some of the things that today myself and RRQ's head coach Ewok are going to talk about. Another really, really great episode, particularly if you're looking to join a team and really push yourself in a professional environment. There's a huge amount of advice here for operating within a team, maximizing your performance in the team, and really looking to build teams that are gonna be championship winning. On top of this, if you're just a player looking to perform in ranked, there is tons of advice from Ewok here. Really great stuff. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Drop a like and subscribe, and I'll see you in a bit. So for me, the best place to start is always to just give a little introduction about who you are and obviously the team you work with and maybe a little a short kind of introduction to your background and how you got into, into coaching. Okay, so um, what's up guys? Uh, I'm Ewok, from, head coach from, from RQ Valorant. Uh, I've been in Valorant basically since the start, been playing beta. I used to, to play a little bit. I thought I could maybe go pro. I thought, ah, maybe a little bit too old already. Um, so yeah, kind of went to, went to the, the coaching route. Uh, worked with Onyx before, and now I'm with RQ, and hopefully um, trying to be there for uh, for a while with this uh, with this team. And I feel like we can do a lot of like a lot of good things with the team we have now. So, how do you feel about the? You talked a lot about the. Oh, you talked kind of about some of this, obviously, with Thomas about um, the kind of changes that you made. And actually, I've, I've obviously watched that interview, and I think there were kind of some points where I wanted to go a little deeper. Um, I guess the the first question that I wanted to ask is where do you kind of how do you see yourself as a coach? You know, it, 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 it's it's interesting sometimes because obviously we don't get the opportunity to see how other coaches work and kind of compare ourselves to how other people work. How do you think? How do you see yourself and how do you think your players see you as a coach? Mm, I think you made an interesting point. The the thing that you don't really see how other coaches do it, right? Everyone kind of just figures it out for themselves, and that's yeah. kind of how it was for me as well. Um, so for me, kind of like backgrounding from what it is to be a coach and to be like that leader in the team came more from traditional sports um mm -hmm. not necessarily as much from uh from esports uh, in the past so um for myself i guess i would be someone that really likes a, a tight bond with the team um it's something that i'm also working on i feel like at times uh, I spoke about this as well with Thomas, when you need to have that divide a little bit mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. being too close with the players and really being um, the person that can be a little bit more critical because the guy that's a little bit more critical is not always your best friend, right? Um, so it's sometimes it's a, it's a, like, it is a fine line that you have to, have to walk to, to make sure that you can give the players the best and do what the team needs, even though it's not always comfortable. So for myself, um, yeah, I think it's 
I do I do generally uh, a decent job I would say with be, uh, knowing when to be more strict and when to, to be more critical uh, mm. being a little bit more uh, of the that type of a critical coach and then also I feel like at times I'm just like the team dad to be honest so uh, I feel like I look at all of them as my kids to be honest uh, even though I don't have any of my own but through this the course of coaching I feel like I have many kids now all, all my past players so it's I feel like I really have uh, that that connection makes my job a lot easier so that I can be more critical like I said mm. I've talked a lot about this in, in in other episodes as well that striking that balance is often in everything not just simply in, in what you described but generally in, in the game striking that balance is often the challenge it's interesting uh, I don't know I just had this thought that I feel like sometimes you know you're more than the coach I mean you're almost like the mother and the father of the team right it's having that feminine and masculine energy simultaneously and for, for me personally I think I found that it's better when you have uh, an assistant coach right and you can actually you you could kind of both embody the different elements of that you know I've generally been the, the kind of harsher coach and then I've worked with someone that I felt has had that more familial energy that's been the kind of friendlier n nicer person to go to right that kind of like I said more kind of maternal energy you don't have uh, on ROQ do you have an assistant coach or is it just is it just you uh, it's just me so uh, at the moment we're we're in the works with uh, a new analyst coming on board been doing mm. a lot of work for the like the last month and a half gone through a lot of we had a lot of really good applicants um, and we hopefully have someone that's uh, that's joining soon so that will be a little bit more data focused for myself yeah. I feel like I am uh, capable for now of doing the strategic side and being kind of mom and dad in the team in the boot camp and everything um, I feel like it is a pretty good analogy to uh, be able like, to be the mom maybe like yeah traditionally a little bit more like connecting on the emotional side and the dad yeah. being a little bit more like like the mom side is traditionally is like the part that says it's fine right brush it off like you're still the best i still love you we can do it yeah. right yeah and then on the dad side you you have to play both right so it's on the dad side it's like it's that's not good enough you know we have our standards and this is what we've set them at the start of the season and this is what we expect from ourselves and we need to improve you know um so yeah mm. for analysts it's more data side that's feel like it's something that i don't get to uh, enough um, and just the extra side, uh, extra pair of eyes for the anti strat thing is something that for me helps a lot that I can just focus on the team strategically when when we're pairing for the for the next team and not kind of spend too much time uh, just looking at bots all day long. Yeah, I mean, there's only so much time in a day, unfortunately, and we yeah. all. Uh, <laughs> I keep on saying this to myself, but like, you do have to sleep. <laughs> I mean, at some point, you do have to sleep. I think it's a challenge. So I think. Um, so you said this and you've kind of you've kind of said it here I think that you're very focused on the strategy how where do you feel on kind of team structure and performance how do you how do you feel about that So it's it's kind of a view I would say I've changed over my course uh, of coaching when I came in I was a little bit more strict in terms of just because I feel like util usage in general was pretty bad mm. uh, at the start of Valorant so then giving them a little bit more of a strict um, sense of how they can use their util and where they should use it and the better players get at knowing how to use their util and uh, the spots where to use it at the start like I feel like for a Valorant coach your job had a lot to do with more like how to use util and like lineups and stuff mm -hmm. and now mm -hmm. it kind of more like that's the player responsibility of course there's always stuff if I see a nice lineup like I'll be helping them as much as possible with each player but then also you come back to that time constraint. There's just not enough time to help every player with his individual agent. So um, then it kind of changes a little bit more to understanding the the macro just of rotations and everything because not everyone has that CS background. Um, if you have a, a background of, um, I don't know, for example, Overwatch or maybe Overwatch has some similar things, but if you're just coming from other FPS titles or maybe it's your first game, then yeah, you can maybe shoot, but you don't necessarily understand how rotations work, what draws out rotations, what makes the other team react in certain ways. So then it going over to a lot more of the macro side, I would say, uh, where you need to understand where you're not necessarily as strict with your util. The players need to be kind of comfortable to be able to use their util when they see fit. And mm. then you help them a little bit more of understanding when to use it rather than just telling them 
you need to use it in here, <laughs> here, and here, you know? So yeah. I think over time, um, I gave players, I'm giving players as I go on a little bit more leniency as the more comfortable I get and like more trust I have in them that they will make the right decisions. And in that sense, I would also, I need to trust myself that I did teach them well enough of them understanding how to use their UTO. Um, mm. And that we can go into the VOD and look at why something is used rather than just that wasn't the right piece of util maybe or like the mm. right spot rather more why what's the thought process do you find it's a challenge being a solo coach when like you say a lot of the things that you want to work on are actually based on the individual rather than the team um for sure um i think there's upsides and downsides to both having many coaches it's uh i was just talking to to another coach recently and uh, we were talking about i wonder when valorant would get to the point where you have like a coach for each for each role and everything. Like mm -hmm. Valorant is so young, right? Uh, in football, in terms of like you have the goalkeeper coach, you have the defender coach, whatever, right? Um, yeah. So if we would get to a point one day where we would have X players that really performed in a specific role where they would come in and teach the, the young guns or like kind of how to play their role, I think we're still a, a way off for that. Um, you see some teams of the Korean, Japanese teams have a, a much larger coaching staff. Yeah. Um, of course, then you just need to kind of maintain everyone on the same page. Make sure everyone's still on the same page, even when you have that many brains cooking together, basically. Um, so, yeah, for myself for now, I think I can cook it on my own. Um, but definitely down the line, the will be, I'll be, you'll be at a, at a deficit for sure um, if you are doing it all solo. Yeah, it's interesting you say this because I guess my vision of the what you've described you do to me sounds more like a strategic coach when I think f from how because obviously I came from Overwatch, right, where we did have people coaching every single role. You know, we'd have a coaching staff of four coaches and the head coach was much more like a. And I guess you kind of almost see them like as, as a staff management so they're the, the head guy and then they're, they're telling all the coaches, this is the vision, this is how I want the game to be played. And then they're kind of disseminating that information to the players. Do you think we'll ever get to that point? Think, do you think we'll ever get to that point or do you think, do you think, do you ever think esports will have the money to fund that many coaches in, in Valorant? Um, I'm an esport enjoyer. I'm pro esports all the way. So for, for us, for our, our careers and everything, I really, I think we'll get to an esport yeah we're going through a little bit of a rush a rough patch at the moment but i think with more stability um and the more and more people we get that the esport or that run the esport orgs that really understand business um and it's not just kind of like a side project maybe mm. um just like some of the I reference again like the football clubs and everything where i think kind of just how you just mentioned now with the with the overwatch coaches it's kind of like the manager in football where he has all the coaches underneath him. Yeah, he's the manager. You don't call him the head coach. He's not necessarily the head coach, right? Mm -hmm. But it's his philosophy that all the coaches implement. So I think we, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure we'll get to that point. Uh, as I said earlier, I think you'll be at a deficit if you don't adapt to being able to have those many minds working together just because uh, just a time constraint. Once again, if you have five minds, if they can work in unison, then you can very much get... Uh, a really positive outcome versus if the time constraint of just being one or two. Yeah, because I think even now, uh, being a solo coach in VCT is probably not that common. You're probably, yeah. well, as far as I know, maybe maybe the only one now. In fact. Yeah. Um, so well, once the analyst joins, I won't see myself as a as a solo coach. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but in terms of strategic, um, for myself, I think. For now, as I said, it's uh, it's fine to be able to do to do because I have a pretty strong uh, idea and identity of how I think the team needs to play. What is uh, what can win in this game right now? Mm. Um, and when there's too many conflict in minds, I think you can sometimes uh, kind of spend too much time on something that we didn't necessarily have to spend as much time on, um, where it maybe is detrimental to the team. So. But for, for myself, if there is someone that I get to work with and I have that really close connection with, um, then there's, uh, there's, it's not I'm saying no to working with the assistant coach 
um, and being able to cook up these things, I would just need someone that's very much on the same page as myself. And for myself, I love having, like, I love having everything open for discussion. Uh, I don't think this. Yeah, I said I have a strong idea of how I want us to play, but also with that said, there's no perfect way to play this game. I think being able to challenge each other in a healthy way and bringing up new discussions and being able to discuss everything and be like being able to improve it is is like so needed in this game. So mm -hmm. um, if you cannot, if it's only just the one your way or the highway. I always encourage my players for whatever. If I give them a strat and they say it's bad, I'm not going to get my feelings hurt. Like this, we, we throw it out the window and we go again. We just uh, they crumble the paper and you just go again. So um, it's it's not something that where it's um, something very specific. It needs to be like this or forcing players to do a specific thing that they're not comfortable with. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, um, well... Uh... I've talked about again it's something i've talked about in the past with other with other people but like about the team identity right it really depends on the team on the players what they're most comfortable doing where you get the most value right you find the positions that you can get the most value and that's where you really you play to your strengths and you minimize your weaknesses and that's not always going to be the same for every single team and we already we already see it right we see it now in the off season we've seen it in vct before where people you know there are some teams that play very aggressive some teams that very play very passive i guess um as a coach, do you have a kind of preference to do? Do you prefer to play a kind of this more, maybe like some of the kind of Korean teams that play very, very aggressively? You know, they're not really wasting much time in the round. Or would you more play like kind of the European style, where more wide defaults, kind of slower rounds, and kind of figuring it out? And where, where, where do you see your your kind of favorite style? Where would you kind of see yourself? Um, I think in terms of a fan, of course, you have to love the fast-paced style. Mm. Um, but for myself, I do kind of pride the teams that I've been on that have a lot of fast rounds, but then be able to play it really slow. For me, I feel like it's in this game, being able to kind of manipulate the map, you need to be able to throw in a lot of fast rounds in between your, your slow rounds. If you're mm. only playing one style and you're always running down the clock, then it gets really difficult sometimes because you just become predictable. So, yes. For myself, I think it's it's very much up to up to the team. I'm, you're not going to force a team that is that's more calculated and that's where their strengths lie to all mm -hmm. of a sudden just run it down the whole time, right? Um, it makes no sense, right? But the same if you have players that are really skilled at taking those duels and they win more than fifty percent of their one v ones. Uh, when you put them in a position, even when they're um, going in a little bit more aggressive, they may be a little bit at like a deficit in the in the gun duel. If that's what they're good at then kind of form your play style around the players that you have. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. once again, what I really want to reiterate is every like coaching job is different in every team, right? There's mm -hmm. no one has the same, same job. It's all about getting max value out of each of your, each of your players, right? So if you come in with a strategic plan or a philosophy that just doesn't suit your players, it doesn't matter. You can have the best plan. It's not going to work. Yeah. Like, uh, I strongly believe that you just, your job is to get the best out of each player. And, mm -hmm that you need to do whatever you need to do. So sometimes you need to be more of the mom, more of the dad, whatever your team needs. That's just, uh, I think, the, the best way to, to go about it as a coach. Mm, I think you're totally right. I mean, yeah, it's just about what's doing best, what is best for the team. I think that's always a challenge. I want to take a, we'll circle back to some of this game stuff, but I want to talk a little bit about your kind of career, I guess, I'll say career in cricket, because I don't know anything about kind of your, your, your life doing cricket. Tell me more about that. Um, so it's from, from a young age, grow up in South Africa, you kind of, you see the big boys, they're playing rugby, they're playing cricket for their country. And mm. that's what you want to do. Like I remember watching A.B. de Villiers is like a big fan. I was a big fan of him. Um, so for the cricket boys, they know him. Then uh, you have Ntini, which is a really famous bowler as well from South Africa. We have Dale Stain. We have so many legends that mm. play, uh, that play cricket. So for them, I used to look up to them. Uh, I used to love Sean Pollock, and I was a bowler in cricket. So for me, I was like, okay, uh, I feel like I, n I never had the pace, maybe of some of the, the really fast guys. So uh, as a bowler, I was a little bit more of like the, a seam, uh, like a, a medium paced seam bowler. Uh, I know it's getting a little bit specific no, uh, with, yeah. uh, with the cricket references. But yeah, so it's just someone I looked up uh, a lot, uh, looked up to a lot. And... 
then I, I figured out I maybe have a little bit of a talent for it. I was always a little bit short and then only got a, a growth spurt a little bit later. And then um, kind of when I noticed, okay, I'm always in the, like the first team of the school and everything. Uh, used to captain the cricket team um, and everything. So I think that's where uh, maybe I learned some leadership uh, abilities and capabilities mm -hmm. to be able to lead a team. Um, so it's, for me, that was, it was always the plan to go play professional cricket. So once that didn't work out, um, it's kind of the swap over to esports, but it's, um, just team sport is, this always attracted me. I used to play all the sports as a kid. Um, I didn't really enjoy the individual ones as much. I used to play a lot of tennis, but I felt like the, I had to, I really much preferred being able to rely on teammates and kind of, it gave me a lot of satisfaction. Uh, individual satisfaction if I could help someone else and they succeed and I think that very much kind of came with me to coaching for me it really gives me a lot of like it makes me feel good on the inside yeah it maybe sounds kind of selfish but it is something that drives me when I'm working with a player we're working really hard with the player mm. and we're working with those long hours and you can see them improve and they're noticing that they improve as well then it's just makes it kind of like oh it's, it's worthwhile like you improved someone for the better and all of a sudden his career is looking different you know um i think that's it's like one of the greatest feelings you can have as a coach mm. i agree i mean for me it's always been about the people i think for most for most coaches it's about it's about the people right i mean yes it's it, of course it's selfish because we're we're humans and we can only experience what we experience right so you have to be motivated by your own feelings at the end of the day right it's always going to be about how it makes you feel but that's because you've you've, you've helped someone else why didn't you go all the way with cricket so um i was busy playing still in high school playing so i was trying to get into the first team when i was turning around 16 17 so just for a quick backstory, like I'm a left-handed bowler and that's what I do mostly. My batting was always pretty average uh, mm -hmm. because instead of in practice, I would rather be the coach would say, all right, it's your turn up to, to go bat. And I'm like, wait, can I, can I bowl a couple of more overs? Can I, can I do some more bowling? Uh, that's always kind of been my strong suit. Mm -hmm. So, but with that came, uh, the action I had was always leaning a little bit more over to the right side when bowling with my left arm. And it kind of, it caused the, the muscle at, the, uh, at my spine, my lower back, start to develop more than the one on the right side because it was stretching more under more pressure. Mm. So it started to develop more and more and it started to push my vertebrae to the right side because the right side was underdeveloped. Yeah. Um, so actually, I have a funny story when I was at the physio um, at one of, the, uh, one of the tournaments where I said, okay, I have some discomfort in my back and the physio went in and okay, I laid down, he gets the oil and everything and he starts massaging. Uh, so they actually had uh, a couple of trainees for the physios and then the physio, the main physio was, that was doing my back, he called in all the trainees and <laughs> told them to come and take a look. Yeah. And then from then, I kind of noticed I have a problem. Yeah, I had discomfort, but I always thought it's just because of overuse. But then turns out, okay, this is why... I am having these these problems. So then it's usually after long sessions I would have the problem. And then it turned into it's just a couple of overs of bowling and all of a sudden I have a problem. So mm. for myself, being out then with injury, then when I tried to come back, I felt like I just wasn't the same. Uh, I lost some pace uh, bowling. Uh, I had to shorten my run-up and everything. I had to change some things. I had to change the way I was bowling. And... I felt like I wasn't effective enough anymore. And for myself, I'm extremely competitive. So I noticed kind of in a moment of sadness, I would say, that mm -hmm. I don't think I can make it anymore. Um, so that's, I decided, okay, well, on to the next, I guess. You're not the only person I spoke to about this. Maybe this is a bit of a deep question, but it's something that interests me, I guess. Do you ever worry that you might have to overcome a similar hurdle in esports and then say do, do you feel like you've kind of grown from that because i guess i mean i see this in myself as well i, I mean similar similar kind of background um not the same sport um and like you know world-class competition and then just like not as good as you think and then you're like oh well i guess i just won't do it anymore do you ever worry that you might experience a similar thing in in gaming 
for myself, I think as long as I believe I, I'm not at some deficit, then I have no reason to not be able to be the best. If that makes sense in terms of if I'm potentially with a team and the team is just not performing as well as what I feel like we should be performing, but there's no specific reason for the team not being able to perform and that it simply might just mean we need to work harder, uh, we need to be working more efficiently maybe, then I think it would always be to just try and be the best. Um, and for myself, I'm kind of fixated. Uh, when I'm fixated on something, I'm extremely fixated on something. So then like a lot of people in this field, I think. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So if there's the opportunity to be the best and I see other people that are the best, I get jealous. Like it's, mm, that's just mm. what it is. Like I, I want the team to be there. I want to be the, the I want the team to be at the top. So um, I think as long as it's it's possible, then we need to work harder. Mm -hmm. I feel you on that. I think there's a lot of a lot of people below tier one, I think, uh, that, or even even to, even in a tier two scene, that are extremely lazy and just got. I, I mean, I see them very frequently and just feel like your talent is totally wasted. It's very frustrating to see that. Actually, when you talk about working harder and really having that drive, I wish uh, I wish more people shared that philosophy. But I guess that's also probably why they're tier two and not tier one. That's uh, often I feel like what separates it. So speaking of kind of players and, and picking up players. Something that you said in the interview with Thomas was that the, the boom players that you saw, you, you really felt like they had kind of strong fundamentals. Um, could you expand on that a little bit? Uh, I think their, their previous experience in, in Counter-Strike um, made them a step ahead of some of the competition. Yeah, there's a lot of people that had uh, experience in um, other FPS titles, but being able to transfer the skills is not something everyone can do i feel like mm. uh some people can transfer the aim other people can transfer only their brain and some people can do both so when you do get both you're usually a step ahead and then if you do have the work ethic to understand that this is a different game i need to not just rely on what i know and i need to learn then you're taking that maybe that extra block that you where you were maybe a, a head start above everyone else mm, that mm. you keep staying kind of like that block above everyone else because I feel like it's so easy to just think okay I'm a step ahead and all right I'm not going to work as hard and someone else is working hard and all of a sudden you're a step below um, I think that's just something that we see in esports all the time mm, uh, mm. that's why it's it's so hard to win back to back stuff um, yeah yes there's something where you kind of some complacency. Um, I guess even though you don't necessarily notice it. Um, mm. I think maybe it takes you a couple of years to notice that you became complacent. In the short term, um, you don't maybe necessarily notice it. It's interesting you say about complacency because I think... Uh... I don't, I don't know what the score was right now, but Fnatic uh, Cloud9 going very close. And I don't know if Fnatic are going to lose another title. They probably, well, if, if it, the result is already in, we just don't know what it is. But it's yeah. uh, to see it so competitive when you have um, Curry, who's essentially a ranked player, as everyone likes to call him. I think he's an incredibly intelligent player, someone that like, I, I really enjoy his content to come in and just play for Cloud9. And then they're, well, they've taken two maps off Fnatic. I think it says a says a lot about. I don't know. I, I think I think in some ways it's not simply just the the fact that maybe they, like they've lost the drive. I don't think that's necessarily always true, but also that sometimes it's just you can only have so many ideas. You can only innovate so many different ways, right? And your 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 own personal experiences shape the way that you innovate things. And I think there's only you know, you're going to cap out at some point until someone else comes in and has a different approach that can change the way that you innovate because you come predictable in the way that you innovate. I think yeah. that's uh, I think that's part of the challenge that you have to overcome. I, I think it would be... Omapuri. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I think with Omapuri joining, um, he, mm, uh, mm. I think I could call him a good friend now already. I got to, to spend some time with him in Pacific, so I was really excited when, when he got the job. Yeah. So, of course, I think they... They most likely only practiced when they were trialing him. So, like, you can see all of their stuff is still their old stuff. And yeah. even maybe if they had new stuff, would they even show it? So, I think for for them to bring in a, another mind 
um, and exactly kind of what you said, being able to innovate maybe in new ways, not only mm. in the same way that you're mm. always innovating. Um, I think that could be something that's really interesting for them. So I'm super excited for him. Uh, I think it's a big step for his career as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. I really hope that they can do do great things over there. Um, I'm really happy to to have a friend over there. Um, and I think, yeah, I think they'll be able to do great things. Uh, there's no reason why they, they should not be able to. Um, it seems like they, they have the players that have really good work ethic. Um, mm. And I think with, with Alma putting joining, um, I think the, yeah, there's no reason to, to think that they can't maybe even repeat or surpass what they did uh, this, this past season. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're absolutely right, and it's interesting. Yeah, innovating, doing new things in new ways is kind of a strange yeah. thing. You know, the double new. But I think, uh, yeah, I think it's something that we're all going to have to move towards because, you know, we've got to be creative if you want to stay. If you want to stay ahead, I want to circle back actually because I, 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 I want to go deeper. You say about kind of the stuff that they transferred from CS, and I guess for, for me, I want to also be able to provide knowledge, not just to. Um, not just to other coaches, but other players, just people generally in the in the tier three, tier two scene that kind of really want to kind of make step forwards. I guess what kind of things did you see in their play that you think that sets you apart as a team? That's the kind of thing that other teams need to strive for. They need to do this because that's something that really, you know, it shows that you've kind of got that level and you're able to compete. I think with both of them having past experience, of course, uh, flips it are more recent as IGL kind of, also jumps out that the showing that these guys can lead other people and mm. also understand the game and there's also there's a big difference between being able to understand the game and being able to share your vision on the game being able mm. to share that with other people and try and help them understand the way you understand it and it's not necessary that you always have it perfect um i don't think ever anyone has it perfect but being able to just share what's going on in your mind. And I feel like in general, IGLs, it's something that they have practiced because it's a skill you need to practice. Mm, um, mm, mm. It's not just, you don't just wake up one day and you become an IGL. Um, I think it's something that takes a lot of time. So that being able to share your vision on how the game is played in a way that you need to do it fast in the middle of the, and in the middle of a round and also outside during VOD reviewing, it kind of helps uh, especially with the two of them that had a pretty similar vision on the game as well. So that makes them being able to, to play off each other in a really nice way and being able to, to rotate around the map. And then also uh, with Xfero, formerly known as Tebottle, being an ex-teammate of Almimor, uh, they're also, they're really, and also being close friends, they really understand how each other play. Um, mm -hmm. And that really mm -hmm. kind of helped us form this core of, people understanding how to react and you know what your team mm -hmm. how your teammates going to react um because there's a lot of things in valorant that because there's so many abilities flying you need to kind of some things need to be done without being spoken and yeah that is uh is something that where differentiates some of the best teams versus some of the teams that are kind of trying to get for that top spot i feel like a really good example is maybe dota 2 if you ever, ever hear dota 2 comms um, mm, I'm pretty mm. sure it's probably the same in League of Legends. There's some teams, really good teams, top tier teams. If you listen to their comms, they're almost not even talking. Yeah, like, yeah. Just, all right, stunning. Dead. Let's go next target. Like, that's all because they know exactly what to expect and they know their teammates going to follow up correctly, not stacking your stuns. Um, being able to to combo off them is just that can, just comes with playtime and uh, being really familiar with each other. I love that you take that analogy back to kind of get Dota is a game that I played played a lot of actually. I've, I've got like a good yeah three three thousand hours in Dota, so I played quite a lot of it. It's interesting actually because I think the people we could learn a lot from those guys because simply because they have so much more playtime, right? I mean, m many of them have obviously been playing them longer than than really the most of the FPS players that we have now. Certainly, certainly the ones that we have kind of up and coming FPS players that, like you say, for some of them, Valorant's their first game, and they're just they're just they're cracked right but there's a lot of things that they may be missing in terms of that intuition and synergy that they're kind of you know they're they're, they're it's almost like they're kind of synced up on a, on another level where they already know what the reaction is before it happens right and i think that's often the case i think uh, it's something that people need to understand i guess also how i guess from your perspective how do you get to that point how do you build that synergy you know if you're a team and you, 
you, you, you want to kind of work towards that. How, how do you think you can do that? I don't think there's any secret sauce or, or mm, anything mm. for it. I think... And what's your personal approach? With, yeah. Um, I think it's really important in general to be able to connect really well outside of the game mm, mm. where, yeah, it's maybe not... It doesn't look like it's directly correlated uh, having that outside synergy with each other, but it does make a way into game. Um, it just, like, in general, trust is a big part mm. of things going unspoken and doing things together if you can trust someone outside of the game and you have complete faith inside of the game with with your teammate then it opens up these possibilities of doing insane things without mm. it going spoken so uh, and then of course the other thing is just to have playtime together uh, you mm. need to be in game together and play as many of these scenarios as possible so yeah. if you've seen the scenario before you know how your teammate reacted he's most likely going to react in the same in the same way if you've gone over the vod review and he shares his opinion mm. on how he believes this play or how you should approach this scenario if you can really internalize it and then next time if you have a similar situation that's also where a lot of the best players uh come out on top versus some of the more like tier two tier three players where the scenario doesn't have to be exactly the same, but mm. you need to identify that it's the same principle. Yeah, um, yeah. And because of it being the same principle, you know how your teammate's going to react and you can react accordingly as well. I think this uh, this really comes back to a question I wanted to ask. I'm, I'm kind of going out of order that I've written these questions, but it, it works really well here. How do you kind of find that balance, I guess, between a kind of broad approach to where you can apply things to lots of different situations compared to, okay, here's a set play, let's do this. How do you find that balance? Where do you think the set plays are really useful? Where do you think the broad principles are really useful? I think every set play is not fulfilled or is not complete without the understanding of the broader spectrum and the broader principles. Because mm -hmm. when you run a strat and you only know what you need to do inside the strat and exact you to where you need to go and where you need to move then it opens up to the moment when you see a different piece of util or something different happens that hasn't happened in scrims you don't know how to react mm -hmm. but if you can fall back onto the common knowledge the team has on how we react the protocol that we have on how we react it kind of complements your strat and it makes your strat look better versus your strat working only versus a certain scenario um this is something I've also uh, had to improve when, when making strats as well, that it mm. can work for more things. Um, when you're defaulting that you're prepared for any situation happening, that you know how you want to react, that it doesn't only work in a specific scenario. Mm. And when you don't get that scenario, your strat fails, right? So yeah, then yeah. your strat is cool in theory, but it doesn't necessarily work. Yeah, I think yeah, it's interesting because I've talked with a lot of people about this. I think uh, people's... It's interesting how like varied people's approaches are to this. I mean, I, I agree. And I think most people would agree, actually, that, yeah, you have to have like this kind of foundation that you build upon and then you kind of have the set plays on top of that. And uh, how much you can script things, I think, depends as well on your team and how much kind of that natural synergy they already have, right? Whether you need to kind of go six steps kind of removed from that point and think, okay, well, if they do this and they do this, you know. But then, yeah, if you have that really fundamental understanding, then you can kind of just fall back onto that. I, I guess that the, the, to, to go one step further how much do you how much do you view that creativity should be available to players in the game you know if they're kind of feeling it maybe you you've got someone playing on an operator how much how much input do you think they should be able to have on 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 your kind of plan in a round almost 100 hmm. percent um i think you should be able to express your creativity in a way that benefits the team every single time you almost get the opportunity to. Mm. Yes, you don't want to stray too far from known grounds and known waters that you haven't practiced before because maybe your teammate doesn't understand uh, or know how to react because you did something that hasn't been practiced. But when you can have creativity in game with players that do understand what your thought process is mm. and your philosophy of how you're going to play, um, it sounds like it's so 
like just words your philosophy of how you play right but you can like any player that has his best friend and has been playing with him for many years like mm. you know there's something right like you it feels like especially when you're when you're in the zone it just feels like you can read their mind right like that mm. philosophy of how they play is like it's on subtitles while you're playing and you know how to react so how, so it kind of comes back to your previous question as well how to build it it's, it's not easy of course everyone would just do it there's a reason why so many rosters fail as well and yeah don't yeah. necessarily reach the heights because of synergy issues right um mm. and then it comes back to roll things as well because your mid maybe don't have the synergy if you're not on the right roll um mm. so it, it is very intricate uh, and it can all come crumbling down soon but uh or really fast i guess but then it's kind of just that comes back all the way full circle to like that trust in your teammate if you can have the trust outside trust in game then like there's there's no limit on the creativity that you can have uh with your teammate um but then it's also really important to bring that creativity into practice as well Mm. that it's not Mm. just all of a sudden you're doing crazy things in in a tournament where this is not what we practice yeah, so when it comes to practice, I guess, how do you how do you like to approach that? Would you say, okay, guys, I really want us to practice this default today or these defaults or this execute or I, I want to have some free creativity? How do you kind of how do you kind of balance that, I guess? Um so I'll I'm usually the one that's in control of um working out the and creating the playbook. Mm. Um if there's certain things in the playbook that I want them to practice. Or if it's maybe I made a new a new default or a new strat, I want them to run it as many times as possible. If I'm not, maybe I'm not 100% sure yet, it works in theory, I want to see what happens in practice, what are the different reactions. And then if you run it a couple of times in a row, you see what everything can go wrong. So then mm-hmm. the players start understanding what the reactions are. So sometimes you'll get where you have to practice a strat over and over. Um, but then for myself, all my players uh, can hopefully attest to this. When they want to do something when they want to be creative the only like the only two rules that they have is inform your teammates about it like bring them along do it together and secondly is it what's best for the team in this round because Mm. that Mm. should always be the objective is to win the round for the team and you doing something creative is is a lot of times needed because you just can't be doing the same thing the whole time, but it needs to be at the right time. Um, and your teammates need to be on the same page for whatever you want to do, right? In mm. scrims, you have a little bit more leniency in terms of, oh, I just wanted to try. Okay, maybe I troll. But now you did try it. If you're never going to try it, then you'll never know, right? So dying in a stupid way in a scrim doesn't really exist if you were actually trying something and you were trying it together. Mm. Like, mm. So mm. that's something... For me, where it's it's always that's what practice is for. We want to be trying new things, and if it works, all right, let's add it, right? Uh, if it if it doesn't work, okay, well, we try it, right? Because also you need to be exploring these creative things because you need to know what other teams can do against you as well. Yeah. The more yeah. you are exploring, you kind of know what possible things can happen against you, right? So uh, I feel like that's super important to be able to kind of be able to express yourself. Um, and for myself, I, I love a player that is bringing as many ideas as possible. And that's not just sitting like a robot and just doing what he's told. Like, yeah, that's, you're not going to be the best team like that. Well, you're not learning, I think. And I think that's really the key, right? I think mm. that really should be the objective of scrims, right? Is to get something from it, right? You either improve a pre-existing setup that you have or you learn something new that could, could work or could make something better in the future, which I think, yeah, I think it's so important. I want to um I wanted to circle something circle back to what you said before about um philosophy right and I I think again for for me this this podcast as well has really become so much about performance because it's becoming a much much bigger thing right a lot of people they can shoot they know how the utility works people understand like basic rotations right we're getting to the point where there's kind of like basics that most people probably even at like tier two level they kind of have that level of understanding they can play the game how do they really go to that 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 next step i think it was really interesting that you say um you know you really understand each other outside the game it goes so much deeper it's certainly something that 
I think a lot of people can relate to this, that like a lot of us have gone through periods where we've had like a best friend, like an online best friend, you know, and you've played, you've been grinding a game with them. And then you go to another game and you still know exactly what they're going to do, despite the fact that it could be a totally different game. It could be you, you played a MOBA with them and then you go to an FPS and you still understand by the way they're speaking, the, the tone of their voice, the speed at which that they're speaking. You understand what they're trying to communicate on a deeper level. And I think that's why it isn't simply about just grinding the game together, but doing bro a broader set of activities where you can really understand them as a person and what they're trying to communicate to you. And I think in that way, for, for me, actually, a lot of that then kind of comes back really fundamentally to communication, right? A lot of it's about communication and those subtle cues that I think we don't necessarily realise the the stuff that almost that isn't said that is said you know exactly yeah it's like the like you'll see some football teams that are amazing and the players half the players don't even speak their like each other's language right like they just know how it how they play they know where the player is going to be and I think in Valorant it's this it's no different right mm, if mm. you can have those like you said the subtleties of they're like in football maybe it's like this the body language of when he's going to make a play when he's going to make a run but i think it's the same in Valorant, body right? language is kind of the same yeah yes you know when he's gearing up for something aggressive yeah and, and you're not going back to site when he's the one aggro mm -hmm. like that, that mm -hmm. you can have that without being said um is is so valuable for any team that's trying to trying to compete and win big things yeah, i think sometimes we don't pay enough attention to that because we're trying to solve what we think are bigger problems, all right, when the realm totally falls apart. Um, but sometimes I think actually that a focus on that would be helpful, especially for kind of lower level teams, is to really try and focus on building that synergy because nothing else works without it, right? On a, on a fundamental level, if you don't have that basics of team play, then how can you expect anything to work? I think sometimes yeah. we, should, we should go back to that. So another topic I wanted to talk about was kind of, what kind of IGL do you like? It's a very open question. Um, so for me, I don't know if I could say I haven't worked with that many different IGLs just in Valorant. Um, mm. I've only worked with three, uh, well, for longer stints with three different IGLs, and they were all a little bit different. Um, some are a little bit more micromanagey, um, and others are they have strengths in different suits where they are maybe a lot stronger at mid-rounding or they're really good at understanding the playbook and when to call each thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that's extremely important for myself. I don't know if I, if I have like a perfect IGL in mind. Like there's, there's a lot of good IGLs in Valorant, right? Um, for myself, like from the outside, of course, like people like Poster, FNS, like these guys, um, they seem like real leaders in the team and great IGLs, but because I haven't worked with them, like I'm not sure exactly how uh, that dynamic would be. I would mm -hmm. love to kind of um, have the opportunity to pick their brain and understand yeah, me how too. they... <laughs> yeah. So uh, for myself, I think it's the most important, the, the favorite part for me for IGL, or what I look for on IGL, is just being able to hear everyone out and then taking that information and forming it into a way that everyone understands it and then me and the IGL, we need to have that synergy in terms of that we can criticize each other. I can tell him if he called a really bad round and he mm. can tell me if I'm a, I made a bad strat or this is not good. That, mm. But mm. we still have the same vision because that we can reference our joint vision in terms of this does not necessarily contribute to or is in line of with how we want to play. Because sometimes you don't get it right. right? That's just how it is. Mm. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and someone being able to tell you and telling you in a way where it's constructive and you can really like build off it, understand uh, why it's not good. Because I feel like if you're in a team where the coach and the IGL are on separate pages, I feel like the team is just doomed to fail. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's really difficult for a player. I don't expect any player to have to choose between his IGL and his coach. Like, mm. that should be like choosing the same person. Uh, yeah, they're going to have some some different things of how they like to communicate or they have some things where they're a little bit different. Of course, we all are, right? Mm. But it's important that you never have to, as a player, be put in the position to force to choose between 
your your coaching staff and your IGL because at the end of the day, right? Coaches, yeah, we have a lot of impact and everything, but for most of the game, those five boys are together, right? Is yeah, like so if it's the the five boys, five girls, they are stuck together. Your coach cannot help you out in the middle mm. of a round. He cannot mid round for you, right? So then, for myself, how I like to see myself, I like to see myself as that little thing on his shoulder, <laughs> yeah, talking, yeah. whispering into his ear that he can remember what we said in vod reviewing. Uh, or remember, okay, we it's really good to follow up this strat with this strat, or it makes sense how they're playing at the moment. Mm-hmm. Right, can we go with this strat? Right? So when I feel like I can be that little, hopefully, an angel on his shoulder, not the devil on his shoulder, if I can be that on his shoulder and that he can take what I say and also think for himself mm-hmm. um, and then be able, then I feel like if I can do that, then my role is what needs for the team uh, in terms of like the strategic part mm. how helpful do you think it is when the other players also understand the strategy on that kind of level as well uh, i think it's 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 so important for them to to understand the strategy in terms of how they need to react if they understand what the the macro idea is of why we're having this default or this set play or whatever if they understand the why um it's there why we are doing it and they understand of how to react and they're just not they're not just sitting and waiting for the IGL to say, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So just like a lot of these things that we've mentioned already uh, in this chat, there's a lot of things that are a lot easier said than done. And yeah. it's not like, well, I can at least speak for myself. It's not like I have it perfect either, right? Uh, mm-hmm. We can have all of these things where, yeah, this is how it's supposed to be. But at some times, it's just some players, uh, for them, it's not necessarily their strong suit. Um and they have different qualities in the team. They bring different things to the team. Every player, you need to try and harness what they're really good at and try and build up what they're bad at. Uh, not mm. just kind of exclude everything. Okay, they're really bad at this. I'm just going to focus what they're good at. Um, and then they may be, if they're not doing as well as what they're, what they're good at, and then they're just it's basically 4v5. Um, mm. So that's something I try to do every day um, with my players to try and kind of make them a little bit more of a complete player and that is understanding more of the like the playbook and understanding why the the why why we're doing uh each strat and each set play understanding how to react and once again not just waiting for the IGL. yeah i think the why is such an important thing that again i think is something that often can kind of separate players on a like lower tier to a higher tier it's just the it's 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 not simply okay. This is the things we're going to do in this in this play, this default, whatever. But the objective is to do this to force them onto B, where we've got to set up, and you know we're going to be really strong there, and we're going to rotate there early because the objective was to do that. And I think uh, yeah, sometimes miss that point. Um, I think in Overwatch we always use this word. Uh, I think it's probably a word that people are kind of familiar with. The phrase win condition, right? Is what well, actually is what are you going to do that enables you to win the round and that's always well why are we doing anything in a round is well ultimately that's what it should lead to is the the thing that's going to make us win the round that they just walked into a four stack of guys on a site with a setup with all the util that there and, the strat. yeah because yeah, it's a strat right but then people yeah. don't people often don't think about that right sometimes um yeah, like a thing that I've struggled with uh, kind of recently in scrims, maybe I, I shouldn't say too much, but about maybe people pushing when they when they shouldn't because they don't understand that that's not the objective, right? You want to be the solo guy there, get the deep info, it's fine. But actually, the other guys want to go stack on the other side of the su- uh, other side of the map because that's the whole point. That's the objective. That is your win condition. And I think sometimes, yeah, I think sometimes people miss out on that. They're so focused on I'm trying to do this. I just need to go kill people rather than. Well, what's the point? What's the objective in the strategy? How does the team win the round? Not just, oh, I can go ace five guys. <laughs> I think yeah. it's, uh, yeah, often... Yeah, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know I'm not alone in that one. <laughs> yeah, I think all coaches kind of, not, uh, will kind of have that in the back of their mind always isn't something that they need to kind of like limit with players. Because also, if you're working with talented players, right? If, yeah. If you are really good, then you should have the confidence that you can kill all five, right? Yes, but yes. Not necessarily that you should be doing it every round or you're doing it at the right time, not trying to kill five when it's not like you're just doing it at a time when you're so much at a deficit, your skill doesn't even matter. Yeah, yeah. 
It's it's hard to strike that balance, right? Because I think as well, like you said, you want your players to be able to limit test in scrims and stuff, but then you also want to be able to practice things and to prove that they're reproducible, that you could get that result 10 times in a row and always win. Um, it's a hard balance, that, I think. It's certainly something that I'm struggling with at the moment because, like, yeah, I want you want to be able to limit test. I want you to be able to become the best player, but I also want to know that we can reproduce that strength 10 times and always win and know that we've kind of seen all of the scenarios we did it 10 times in a row in a scrim and like okay we we, we made it as difficult as possible because they were five guys stacked like anti-stratting it essentially and it's like okay can we still beat that okay you know no we can't yes we can we can fall back out of it right you kind of got contingency for a worst case scenario then right i mean like like you say i think that's sometimes sometimes the way you should practice something is well make it as difficult for yourself as possible because then you at least know what a worst case scenario looks like and you're yeah, prepared for it speaking of challenges what would you say the kind of hardest coaching challenges that you you've kind of had um i think for myself as i said earlier i get very uh kind of tunnel vision on um on the game and kind of what the the job is at hand so of course there's always things to consider where uh, for personal life, of course, I made a big change going from South Africa just all, the way, all of a sudden went to Asia and been yeah. here for almost two years. Right? It's, it's a, quite a big change. It's, for myself, I wouldn't say it, it's been too much of a challenge, but I think um, it's something because I don't necessarily notice it just because I'm at the PC most of the time and uh, it feels like you can be anywhere in the world, right? But there is, of course, a lot of challenges that come with that and understanding how different cultures work as well. Um, and that's another like challenge that we'll face in this coming season where we'll have uh, different mm -hmm. cultures. We'll have players from, from different regions, right? So um, that's something that for myself, I feel like um, maybe kind of worked in my favor growing up in South Africa because... Mm. It's not called the Rainbow Nation for uh, for no reason, right? Yeah, so yeah. I feel like it's, for myself, it's, I've been so comfortable with having different types of people around mm. where now when I'm in an environment where it's not my own, I still kind of feel at home um, where it is not necessarily something for me where it's like, Usually it's the fear of the unknown, which maybe kind of makes it difficult to kind of mesh with other cultures because it's maybe they do things differently. Mm. Um, for me, I kind of, I guess, just learned by default uh, growing up in South Africa that you need to kind of just be open-minded about it. And mm. that we're actually, if it, com if it comes down to it, we're all so similar too. <laughs> Like, yeah it's, yeah that's something that always surprises me that we're so similar it doesn't matter where like um even like growing up south africa which is technically like west and uh, like the west doesn't really know that much about the east we're always kind of like traveling more west people like i've mm -hmm. I went to, i went to europe before i went to asia and i didn't really know much about indonesia before or whatever but i always i'm so surprised with how similar everyone is and there's nice people everywhere and mm. there's not so nice people everywhere you know so <laughs> you you kind of just uh it's it's up to what you make of it um mm. so for myself is trying to be very open and understanding of the different cultures that we have inside the team and if we can have everyone feel safe expressing themselves maybe even if it's even if it's in different ways then i feel like it's the team culture that goes and over than what your individual mm. culture is or your individual mm. habits that you maybe have where we can really kind of get together where our culture is like we're a group of friends we really like this game let's work hard and we try to be the best possible at this game so that's it right respect each other let's have a good time and let's work hard like that's that's all i want for my players really and mm. it's mm. it's in everyone's culture as well like there's 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 no one that doesn't like ha like there's no culture that says i hate having good time with my friends right like everyone likes that right everyone likes having a laugh right? it doesn't matter how different you are so it's for us it's kind of you focus on the things we all have in common mm -hmm. 
I think it's interesting you say that, especially the heritage of South Africa. I think that's something that's like, it's a really big part of your culture and especially your sporting culture. There's a number of books that I've read that have been written by people that have been involved in either yeah, cricket or rugby in South Africa. And it's uh, a very interesting kind of perspective on building culture and, and, and kind of team philosophy, I think is something there. Yeah, like Belonging is a book that com comes to my mind uh, as well. It's a book that I thoroughly enjoyed that really talks about team culture and that the guy that wrote it, he did work with uh, uh, the rugby team i think or, or the cricket team or both in fact uh, probably in in south africa so it's yeah it's a good place to come from for for that kind of thing i think actually so you probably sat down with your team by this point and kind of discussed what you would like to achieve in the, in the next season so i'm interested to hear kind of what that discussion was like and and kind of what conclusions you came to so i'm really happy to bring in two players that are really motivated to mm. kind of and they share the same vision we shared this vision with them before they joined and it's something that if you pick up any player you need to make sure that they can align with your vision mm. um and for us our vision as a team is to improve improve on what we did this past season and being middle of the table is not good enough right mm. Mm. for us it's very black and white we have a standard that we're setting for ourselves and we're going to do the best possible if at the end of the day we don't reach what we wanted to reach we didn't reach the heights that we wanted to reach that we know if we look back it's not because of a lack of trying yeah uh, yeah this this is something i kind of reiterate to all of my players i keep telling them your career is so short please mm. do not look back at your career in a couple of years and regret that you did not give everything it's mm -hmm. it's such a waste of talent if you have everything there's so many kids out there there's so many young people out there that would kill for what some of these players have so taking advantage of this opportunity that you mm -hmm. do have is everything because it's not lasting forever so just mm -hmm. give it your all enjoy it with your friends and i think the journey that you look at if you if you look back the journey is really important like yeah that's the cliche right it's not always the end goal that gives you the fulfillment is that journey so let's have a good time kind of on the journey and we make sure that we do everything in our power to that this journey leads to where we all want to go basically mm. so for mm. us that's that's our vision um the organization vision uh, and the team's vision luckily we align on this and we really want to be representing indonesia russia also champion from japan korea we mm. want to be representing these people that at international events and we want to make them proud there like that is our goal we want to be going there and being like we want people to say yeah i'm a rq fan that's that's my team you know like look at them go yeah they like we maybe thought at the start, oh, these guys weren't so great, and they keep. It's like that team when you, with you stick with them, then you kind of build that bond with mm. them because they they keep improving. You can see these guys are really giving everything. So mm. Mm. if the fans can see you giving everything, then it just kind of boosts you as well, right? Um, mm. And then we can kind of try and do these things together because it's not just the five guys that are in seats that's doing this. There's a whole organization behind them. There's a, a whole lot of fans. There's also that's buying your jersey, that's watching your streams, that's supporting you when you're playing. Like, there's so much more people that's contributing outside of you just sitting on your chair. So, you not giving everything makes no sense, right? It's it's not mm -hmm. just you, right? It's there's so many people that's like trying to help you to get to and reach that victories. Mm. Yeah. So we're at our our hour. So I want to thank you so much for for your time. And if there's anyone you want to shout out or obviously shout out to RRQ, I bet if there's anyone you want to shout out or obviously plug your own social media, then please do. Uh, for myself, I just want to shout out to you. Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, really enjoyed having, having a chat with you. Um, I think all of these things, um, as I said before, it's, this is what we, like the stuff that we discussed now is what we strive towards. These are not things that if you're, if you're listening or you're watching, right? These are not things we're not talking from a point of view of that we have it perfect, right? Mm. It's you should be striving to get it to perfect, right? And we're, we're talking about all of these things and your team culture, right? That these are things that we can aim for. 
and when you are aiming for these things, when you get the team together, then it will lead to positive results. And I firmly and 100% believe that if you are really, really motivated and making sure all of these things align, then you will guarantee results. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I totally agree. Thank you. Thank you again.